Welcome to Breaking Ground. I'm your host, Devin Kolka. On this show, we meet with industry leaders in the design, real estate, and construction industries. Today's guest is Tom Adavissimo, principal of Griner Maltz. We're really excited to have him on as we discuss the craziness in the industrial market, and we even get into some cryptocurrency. Enjoy the show. All right, we're here with Tom Adavissimo, principal of Griner Maltz. Griner Maltz, you guys are a commercial brokerage firm that has a focus on industrial, correct? Yes, sir. Been around yeah. for, since 1953, really have a finger on the pulse when it comes to all real estate, uh, specifically industrial. Uh, and right now, as we both know, the market is on fire. I was looking at statistics recently. We're at like a, a 4.8 percent yeah. vacancy rate on Long Island. Yep. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, it's unprecedented as far as that goes. Um, as far as a zero, you know, four percent is like a statistical zero. So there's great, basically gridlock in the system. Can't move. It's wild. Almost, you have to catch something before it gets on the market in order for it to actually move. And, and can can things keep up on this i know e-commerce keeps keeps growing and that's kind of feeding the beast yeah but at, at what point do do we see a correction or or are we going to see a correction good question i mean as far as long island goes i mean the entitlement process takes so long to occur so anything coming online will take a few years uh, what's available now is older buildings with lower ceiling. What this market is screaming for are big boxes with high ceilings and boxes where accessible to the expressway and where over the road trucks can make a, you know, a pass at it. So a good swing room in the, in the rear yard, as you know, you're going to need at least 75 to 95 feet to get a 53 footer in there, but not just one or two, you need multiple dock positions for these guys to really operate in, especially the Amazons and e-commerce of the like. Their warehouse is kind of like a moving um, square foot uh, model because you can have 200,000 square feet but get 600,000 square feet of utility because of the amount of trucks that go through it, the amount of velocity that these trucks come and go. So they drop off and they ship. They drop off and they ship around the clock. So they don't value the buildings like we did well, on a per square foot basis. They go by per truck and how often it can go through the building and, and create volume and velocity uh, with the inventory. You know, you talked about how the, the old inventory has these, these lower ceilings. Uh, and we both know, you know, we're looking for 34 plus 50 uh, clear. Mm -hmm. There's really two players in the market that I know of uh, that are doing the um, the ceiling lifts, and they, they must be swamped right now because uh, everything out there is at, you know, 20, 24. Why back then did people want to build at that height, but now the demand mm -hmm. is so different? Wow. Um you know, I guess the, back in the 60s, you know, the average height was 14 and a half feet, and most of them were manufacturing buildings. Uh, so manufacturing did not require a high ceiling. Uh, they didn't want the high ceiling because when you have CNC machines and uh, grinders and lathes and presses, you don't need the ceiling height. If anything, they didn't want it because then you would have to create, well, you have to have more heat and air conditioning uh, per volume. So they wanted a lower ceiling. There wasn't much distribution back then. Uh, Grumman was manufacturing and all of the um, associated companies, Raytheon, uh, Hazeltine, Fairchild Republic, um, all of those manufacturers and everybody that were associated with them, all the mom and pop machine shops, they didn't require the high ceilings very few warehousing at that time. Because remember, we were a bedroom community back in the 50s and 60s and very little distribution for off the island. We were basically overflow from Queens to Long Island and then people would work um, you know, locally. So there's very little uh, you know, uh, need to move anything off of Long Island with a truck, not and, like today. And now what we're seeing today is People are 
you know, having their, their headquarters or their distribution center on Long Island and then moving off of Long Island. So, you know, years ago, people wanted to be in that Nassau County area, maybe, mm. you know, Port Washington Industrial Park, et cetera. And then it kept moving, you know, it, Melville became right. became a hub. Hop Hog, obviously, one of, one of the larger hubs in the region, in the country, in the country you know, second largest industrial yeah. park behind Silicon Valley, as yep. they say. Yep, um, no doubt. And now we're, we keep seeing it go east, you know, we see, you know, Yapank, Shirley, Calverton. Mm -hmm. How far east are people going to willing to go? You know, are, are these land opportunities in Calverton getting scooped up? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the bigger pieces out there um, is in contract. I'm not sure if it closed, but there is a reverse commute mentality right now. So people that live in the Hamptons, well, they had their apartments in the city. They had their ha houses um, in western Nassau. Now they're moving further east, and they'll go out to their summer home and reverse commute. So these are small business owners that uh, have the ability to maneuver and, and move away from the city and further out east. And the answer is yes, that can happen. They have Gabritsky Airport, which Rexon had built around there, and they've, it's, all, it's fully leased and at high numbers. And then you have people that are living close by because they, they love where they live and they work not too far from their office. So, yeah, that, there's going to be more of that as time goes on. And it's limited land. It's spaced out. So you got 17% covered. So you're, not, you're going to get less building and more open space with the industrial. But we're going to get to a point where you keep pushing east and east and east. And you hit water. And, there, and there's no more you're land. Done. You're done. What do we do from there? Um, good question. Good question, right? Yeah. You know. If you can figure that out, then <laughs> you got gold. Yeah. I yeah. think I think maybe that uh, that roadway from Long Island to Connecticut might happen, and then we'll start just going north from there. <laughs> Make me a politician. There you go. <laughs> Make that bridge from William Floyd Parkway right, right. over to the bridge yeah. uh, on the other side. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we, we started talking about uh, earlier, and we were talking about PPP and mm. I know you have a great business sense in general, so I'm going to get away from the industry a little bit, but the PPP money, the pandemic, obviously it's, it's going to have a ripple effect for years. And we were talking about, mm. you know, what people were doing and what companies were doing mm -hmm. when they were receiving those PPP money. Are we going to be hit with inflation? And, and I'm a believer that, you know, it's bound to happen. I'm not, um, an economist whatsoever, but you keep pumping yeah. money into a system, sure. there's going to be inflation. You're going to see interest rates rise. But even more so, what did people do with the money? And you, and, and you had a, a good take on that where people were became consumers. Can you touch on that a little bit? Well, sure. I mean, right now, nobody's working. So you have this K recovery. So you have Wall Street making really good money. S&P is off the charts. And then all of a sudden, why is everybody on Main Street suffering? So you have this, um, you know, this, this adverse effect of people being able to spend money online and they're not working. So how did that happen? Well, they got $2,000 checks or $1,500 checks, whatever it was, and they became consumers. And you, you speak to a lot of companies on Long Island and you say, well, how are you doing? And they say, well, you know, I wish I could hire more people. I just can't get people back to work. But why is, you know, why is e-commerce like through the roof? Well, they're spending online. They're taking their PP money and becoming consumers, not employees or productive members of the community. I don't think that's good in the long run because, like you said, that could create some kind of inflation. You know, why is, and why are asset prices going through the roof? But yet they're buying them and they're able to spend the money on these things as they go up in value. So pizza, food. Um, you go to the store, anything you buy has become, well, all right, so my wife and I, we have takeout. We noticed that the Chinese takeout that we once had was a large chicken and broccoli is now uh, the large, we're paying for the large, but we're getting the small. The small. I'm seeing the same thing, too. You know, <laughs> so restaurant sizes that? are getting a little smaller. I think even quality at some places, they're cutting some corners, and the prices are creeping up. You know, they're, they're trying to catch up from, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of lost revenue to, sure. you know, I don't, I don't really blame them. It, you know, they no took doubt. a major hit, yeah. but it's, it's, it's changing the way, you know, everyday life is, is going about. Yeah. And then when they come back, so what happens when that money, I, I guess the question is what happens when the money runs out from the government 
and these people go back to work. You know, how is that going to affect tomorrow, six months from now? You know, what is that going to look like? Don't know. And another point we were discussing earlier is the fact that how are banks going to look at balance sheets yeah, six months big. from now, a year from now? Yeah. They know you got that PPP money. Right. But did you get the sales? Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's a big factor. No question. And that's a good point because these folks that are running the small businesses, 50 to 500 people on Long Island, that's what I mean by small business owners. They're all in the same predicament in the sense that, all right, they're in the market and then they have to put their application in for a bank loan and the bank is going to look at it with a jaundiced eye and say, well, are they really making this money? Was it done organically through revenue or was it artificially injected through PPP money? And if their sales were off and they were still able to survive, well, why is that? So they're going to say, well, before we go ahead and take this application and ex you know, accept it for your purchase of more machinery or equipment and a building, we're going to wait six months. They're going to take a wait and see attitude. Where, you know, how are they going to survive after this? Because they're also going to look at that ripple effect that you mentioned of the people that are paying them, their vendors. Are they still going to be doing well? Are they going to be there in six months or a year from now? Because if you say, well, I'm going to have new business coming in, well, that's good. But are those people going to be there when you're ready for them? Where's the business coming from? So it's going to be an interesting year, you know, and banks are taking the wait and see attitude. I feel like banks are on a hold with a lot of things right now. And, and we were talking about, you know, Queens and, and Long Island City and you know you go on on the uh, L I double R and you, you you're going on there you just see crane after crane after crane after crane there you go. you've got all these projects that are mid project and you had a mass exodus out of the boroughs to the suburbs not just Long Island but Connecticut and Jersey and anywhere outside of yeah. the boroughs yeah. those banks you know got to be getting hit right now i'm sure the developers are going to be you know mm -hmm. foreclosing on on their notes and, and mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. going to be an ugly scene mm -hmm. how do we fix that well like everything else it's going to be those guys that were over leveraged at the time that the you know the musical chair stopped somebody got caught holding the bag at a very high number it wasn't you know a year ago, we were getting five, six, seven hundred dollars a square foot for these development projects. You knock down the industrial building and you put up a high rise filled with residential. Residential isn't there anymore, and I'm hearing the prices are coming down to half that because the the FAR is cut in half because they're not there's nothing to fill them. So to your point, all of these cranes are going to stop. Money is going to stop. People aren't going to be buying or moving into these locations. So. I remember back in the 80s, well, the banks inherited these things or they found a way to dispose of them. So then who's that going to be with? It's going to be somebody else with uh, more capital that be willing to hold on to an asset for who knows how many cents on the dollar. Is it 10, 20, 30 cents on the dollar, half? But somebody's going to buy those buildings. And one day when it comes back, they might be the new winners. You know, new wealth will be generated from the fall of... Uh, and pain of somebody else. That's usually how the cycle works. Who will that be? Somebody with cheap money and a lot of it. I think new wealth is going to be generated and, the, and those who have assets right now uh, will be the winners in the future because high inflation, as you mentioned. So, so, so you mentioned new wealth and I'm going to throw a curveball at you right now. Mm. A lot of the younger generation and a lot of people in general are are creating new wealth through cryptocurrencies. Ooh. I feel like every time I turn on, you know, Fox News or or or, or something, you're seeing something on cryptos. Do you have, personally do you feel that this will really become, you know, something that's utilized throughout? Are people going to be trading real estate using cryptos? Where do you see this Fed going? I don't think it's a fad. I think it's here to stay. I think digital money is here to stay for our lifetime and beyond because it's electronic. It's lightning. Um, and it is something that one of the last things that we can digitize. We've already digitized our photos. We digitized all of our files. This was once a file room, I think, and here it is a studio. So now we got to digitize our money. So think about that for a second. So the blockchain itself is a 
Um, well, it, it's it, it's it, it's encrypted, number one, so it's it's safe, and then it's also um, encrypted to the point of authenticity. You can author you you can authorize and, and vouch for the authenticity of the item that's on the blockchain. Bitcoin happened to be one of the first uses of Bitcoin uh, of, of of the blockchain and its utility. So let's say if you had a Mona Lisa and, and there was three of them out there and you want to know which one is the right one, well, if you get Christie's to go ahead and put some pixie dust on the one that's right, that's worth $400 million because now it's authorized. It's, mm -hmm. or, it's authentic. And if you can put that on the blockchain, then it's worth more because now you can authorize it. It's a network that is sound. It's secure. It can't be broken. And it's limited. So now we have, and then it's, it's, you know, through ledger, which I don't understand on how to uh, make it authorized. But Bitcoin, on the other hand, is finite. Um, it is a store of energy. It could rival gold, if, depending on how many people actually buy it and use it and find utility in it. Um, they're starting to show uh, a lot of um, value when it hit a market cap of a trillion dollars, then it, it, it got everybody's attention. Big banks, small banks, uh, the government for the first time is now talking about it. People are starting to use it, but your generation was already on it long before it ever hit. And they were using it and trading it, but they didn't understand it. So now I think, now that more people are seeing the value in it, and maybe there's a chance of a store of value, I think the more people that get on it, the stronger it will get and the more secure the system will get. <clears throat> because right now they're talking about using it for banking, for trading, and for store, uh, you know, for, for actually generating interest against the asset itself, almost like a piece of real estate. You could probably refinance it, you can get interest from it, and you can trade it. You also have to pay tax on it like it's property. So I'm wondering how that's all going to play out. But like everything else that, that people want to use and preserve their wealth, um, they're looking for something. Um, stocks haven't, you know, uh, I don't know how many people have really made money on stocks because you have a 6% return. Um, Bitcoin has gone up 200% for the last 10 years. It's wild. It's wild to watch. And I keep thinking to myself. It, Did I talk too long on that? No, that was great because I threw you the curveball and you, you hit it out of the park. Oh. Um, it's something that, you know, I discussed it yesterday in a group. You just keeps coming up in conversation. So it's a hot topic right now. Um, I, I guess my last question on that topic is, you know, I guess we're, we're believers in Bitcoin. I'm a believer in Bitcoin. But there's all these other that new ones, startups, you know, right. that, are they going to survive? Well, you got to look at the underlying value of it. It's like building a house on sand or bedrock in Manhattan. Owning Bitcoin is like owning bedrock on Manhattan. It's like 21 million pieces <clears throat> of real estate in Manhattan that you're a pioneer. You are owning a block of real estate in Manhattan because it's, you can only build on so much of Manhattan Island. 21 million pieces of it. That's it. And it goes out to the eighth decimal point. So it's fractional. So even if it goes up to, it's arguable, right? It, will it go up to 500, a million? Who knows, right? And I'm sure the government will find a way to chisel away at it and, and, and squash value using paper, which they're already doing, but it's doing well against that. So <clears throat> the, you have to look at the underlying part of that, which is 21 million pieces. They've tried to, you know, create more and they couldn't. And all of the other ones, the, uh, the doji coin, you can create more of those. So that dilutes the value. And they can dilute at any time, kind of like printing more money. So if you want more money, you print it. If you want more doji, you can print that. But you can't make more Bitcoin. So the more people buy it, the more it halves again. The next halve is, I don't know, four years from now. Um, it makes it even harder to buy it. There's only, uh, I think they lost four or five million. Wow. 
wow. because the people who owned it in the beginning lost their codes and they lost everything that went along with it so they couldn't find it and oh, it's gone forever that's tough and they're talking about security of these things well the on and off ramp yeah you can get hackers on the on and off ramp of trading it but the system itself is solid because it sits on the blockchain i love it i love it i'm going to finish off with who are you what do you like to do tell me a little bit about yourself oh wow well I'll, you know first um you know i'm a child of god so the sun sun it shines on my head and, and my job is to um well to uh well take care of my family and and and, and my business and I'm, I'm really kind of simple I, I i don't require much maintenance as far as that goes so i don't have anything that you know that's flashy or things like that uh crying malts is you know something that um fits my personality because I always ask questions, you know, uh, in order to educate myself. And then I always try to look for a better solution to try to come up with a, you know, uh, something better for my client. So try to be a counselor first, then, a, you know, a space cadet, a lot of brokers are, um, in my business. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's easy to just, you know, burn and churn, you know, churn and burn, you know, it's like, so um, knowing your dad um, throughout the years, he was an educator. He stayed on the phone with me when I was a rookie when he didn't have to. And I always remembered that. And I said, you know what? He, he, and that's why he and Bill, Bill Greiner, always got along together because they weren't about the, the dollar itself. They were actually creating a good product, evidence in this park as your dad has built and in Hop Hog and across Long Island. And he's passionate about Long Island. He put his whole heart and soul in it. And that's where the uh, HIA is, you know. He was always an advocate for sewer systems to benefit the community at large because he saw that a need for it. Always built a great building. And, and Bill, on the other hand, he was an educator too. You know, he wasn't really a, a, a broker at heart. He was, a, he was an educator in real estate, and people came to him as a resource. So I, I learned from those guys, and I hope to you know, move forward with that going on. Long way to go. Long You're a great way, guy yourself, to Tom. I've always been a fan since we first met. We hit it off. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on today. Um, if anybody wants to find you, where can they find you? Um, well, you could look on the Internet. My email is there. Or call me on my phone. Is that okay? That is fine. Oh. We can do that. Wow. 516-606-6161. So cool. thank you. Thank you.